Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 19th of June with me, Michael Hewson. So what to make of this week's central bank announcements? There's certainly been plenty to talk about. It's been a positive week for equity markets, um, a really positive week for equity markets, which is perhaps a little surprising when you consider the hawkish nature of both the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank. We heard on Thursday um, that uh, the ECB intends to hike rates by at least another 25 or 50 basis points by the end of the year. And um, having, having hiked rates by 25 basis points this week, and we also heard that the Federal Reserve intends to do the same, hike rates by at least another 50 basis points by year end after raising their dot plot projection for the terminal rate to 5.6% up from 5.1%. I think there had been a widespread expectation that the Federal Reserve, as it paused rates this week, was pretty much close to being done. Maybe we were going to get another 25 basis points um, in July. But ultimately, I think looking at the data, there had been an expectation that we were pretty much close to the end of the rate hiking cycle. And then really, it's just a question of when can we expect to see the first rate cut? So when we got the dot plot projections um, in the wake of the decision to pause, um, markets were caught a little bit offside. Um, we saw two-year yields spike sharply in the aftermath of that Fed decision. Um, they didn't spend very long at their, at their peaks for the week, but they have now started to edge higher again. But if we actually look at this little chart here, we can see they went all the way up to around about 4.78%, drifted back down yesterday, and are now back up again today. So with the Federal Reserve unwilling to step back from its commitment to a pause this month and delivering on the expectation that they're going to keep rates unchanged, the compensation effect was two more rate rises this year. Now, that would put the terminal rate between 5.5 and 5.75. 12 Fed officials projected such a move despite the fact you know and i think this is i think this is the thing that markets are struggling with and i think it's important to understand this in the context of what markets are currently doing markets don't believe the fed when they think that or will when they say that they're going to hike rates by another 50 basis points between now and the end of the year and to be honest neither do i you know the 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 guidance doesn't bear doesn't stand up to scrutiny if you look at the um, the data, the inflation data, um, headline CPI this week fell to 4%, um, and core CPI came in at 5.3, down from 5.5. Okay, so yeah, you could argue that that is still um, above uh, the Fed's target rate for inflation, but I need to remind you that headline CPI is at 4%. The terminal rate is now between 5 and 5.25. So we are already restrictive. And if you actually look at PPI, producer prices for um, the US, they're at 1.1%, 1.1. And core prices are at 2.8. And they've been falling significantly quickly over the course of the year. So the direction of travel for inflation at the moment is very much towards the downside. And actually, if you look at import prices in the US and export prices, they're in negative territory on the monthly and the annualized number. In fact, export prices fell to a record low earlier this week to the tune of minus 10.1%. Now we can see that here, export price index, 
down minus 5.9, minus 6% was revised for April, now minus 10.1. Um, import prices again, minus 4.9, minus 5.9. So the direction of travel on a monthly basis, they're also negative as well. Um, and even if you exclude petroleum on in, in on import prices, so there is a dis, there is a definitive deflationary, disinflationary, whatever you want to call it, impulse that's basically pushing through the global economy right now. PPI in China has been in negative territory for the last six months. In Germany, we've just seen PPI go negative. Germany is currently in recession, technical recession. The EU is currently in a technical recession. And yet we have Christine Lagarde, the ECB, saying that they want to do another 25 basis points in July. She's pretty much said that's a done deal. Um, and we've had a number of ECB officials this morning talking about the possibility, the prospect of further rate hikes um, at the September meeting. I think the bigger question is, will they be able to deliver on that guidance? Now, in the case of the ECB, I think there's a decent chance they may well do that, but obviously it also increases the prospect of a policy mistake, given the fact that growth is slowing. Headline CPI in the EU is falling just as sharply as it is in the US. And I think the bigger question now is, whether or not either central bank will be able to deliver on the guidance that it put forward this week. In the case of the Federal Reserve, I'm not buying it. Um, neither is the market. If you look at what US two year yields are doing, they're still below the lows, still below the highs of this week. Um, which sort of brings me on to a certain extent to this week's central bank announcement and the Bank of England. But before I talk about that, we also had the Bank of Japan. Um, earlier this morning. And again, no indication at all that um, the Bank of Japan is going to be tweaking its currently loose monetary policy settings, even allowing for the fact that dollar yen is back above 141. Now, obviously, this is one call. Got to hold my hands up here. I got this massively wrong. Um, I thought that the Bank of Japan wouldn't be able to hold out against the likes of the ECB and the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England and keep its monetary policy settings loose. Core inflation in Japan is 4.1%. It's well above headline CPI, but Bank of Japan officials seem determined to keep monetary policy settings pretty much as is, which obviously is it heaping further pressure on the yen and likely to push dollar yen up to 142.5% though we are starting to approach very much intervention territory. When I was saying at the start of the year that I could see dollar yen back at 120, I wasn't joking. I really did think that. I thought that the Federal Reserve would eventually have to call time on its rate hiking cycle. We are now in uh, June and they are still talking about another two rate hikes. Personally, again, what's, what's driving the dollar yen higher is not an anticipation that um, the Fed is going to deliver on that, but it's a fact that the Japanese central bank isn't any any nearer tightening its own monetary policy than it was at the beginning of the year. And I think that's one calculation that I think most people have got massively wrong, um, including myself. So the bigger question is now, how far can dollar yen go? Well, obviously, the next target is 142.50. Um, and when we get the next set of monetary policy projections from the Bank of Japan in July, you know, that could be a time where perhaps we might start to see a turnaround. But at the moment, higher highs, higher lows, that's a call that basically you just have to take on the, that I have to take on the chin and say, got that one wrong. But then again, I wouldn't have been short. Um, I wouldn't have run my short this far. I'd have been out long before now. But certainly in terms of my mindset, you know, that, that was, that was a, that was a wrong one. And uh, when you get things wrong, you have to take it up, take it on, the, fess up and take it on the chin. What I haven't got wrong is obviously European markets. They've done very well so far this year. 
and despite the occasional pullback, they continue to do reasonably well. We've got the DAX now trading close to um, new record highs this week as they continue to go from strength to strength. The prospect of um, more China stimulus is helping to boost the DAX there. Um, obviously, I think there's also an expectation that we are closer to the end of the rate hiking cycle than we are to the beginning and that ultimately um, we will start to see, um, we'll, we'll continue to see uh, further gains going forward. But we've certainly seen, we've seen record highs for the, the DAX this year. We've seen record highs for the CAC Caron this year. And the one disappointment I think has been the FTSE 100, which has lagged behind, but is still holding up fairly well. And the one reason the FTSE 100 has lagged has obviously been the big declines that we've seen in natural gas prices and oil prices so far year to date. BP and Shell are big components of the FTSE and obviously the uncertainty in the banking sector, which has weighed on the likes of um, Lloyd's, um, NatWest, HSBC um, and what have you. So that sort of brings me on to this week's topic du jour, because having seen um, the decisions from the Bank of Japan, the ECB and uh, the Federal Reserve, we now come on to the Bank of England. Um, and that is likely to see another 25 basis points rate hike from them. Um, and been an awful lot of column inches devoted to the competence or otherwise of the Bank of England's MPC. Um, I won't I won't regurgitate them, but if we look at the UK two-year gilt yield, it's back. It's moved above the October highs um, of the the gilt crisis then the LDI the LDI crisis then, and that was basically because this week's wages numbers um, came in at 7.2%. Um, average 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 weekly earnings um, surged in the three months to April. And I'm not really surprised by that. If you look at the wages data on the ONS website, you're seeing pay rises in some parts of on some sectors of the economy of between 15 and 25%. Um, so not overly, not, overly, not overly surprised by the fact that wage growth is continuing to hold up. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna slow anytime soon. We've still got the, um, the unresolved industrial disputes that are resonating, rippling through the public sector and private sector pay growth is still fairly resilient, particularly if you're um, able to secure a big pay rise for moving jobs. And the unemployment rate fell back in the three months of April from 4% to 3.8. Um, employment levels, 76% um, record high. And, and yes, while you can argue that there is still a high level of people who are not economically active, um, the labour market, the UK labour market continues to remain tight as more and more people return to the workforce to deal with the rising cost of living. So still expecting to see descents from the likes of Tenreiro and Dingra, but this will be Tenreiro's last meeting on the MPC um, to be replaced by Megan Green um, from uh, a US based economist and some of her recent commentary has suggested that she won't be anywhere near as dovish in her outlook as Tenrero. So I think as we look forward to another 25 basis point rate hike from the Bank of England this coming week, that is likely to um, exert further upward pressure on the cable rate, which is now at 128. We've broken higher and still remain fairly constructive on cable. Um, now that we're above these peaks here, I can now remove these particular retracements because we've now we're now above the May highs, and we we could well head towards 130 and the highs back of April 2022. So we're looking at around about 130, 150 now for a next move higher in the cable right cable rate. Um, now that we've broken through that 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level from the move down from 
the peaks back in May 2021 at 141, 142.50 to the lows of 103.42. So step up all those people who are calling for cable at parity. I'm glad to say I wasn't one of them. I always felt the move was slightly overcooked. Having said that, um, I think once people realize that the Federal Reserve is pretty much done when it comes to rate hikes and the Bank of England isn't, that is likely to potentially support the cable rate further. So certainly looking for 130 on cable, um, looking for euro dollar to revisit its recent range highs on the break higher that we've seen this week. And certainly yesterday, we saw a big breakout on the euro dollar above the 50 day moving average. Now back at 109.50. Um, if we can get back through this level here, then we're certainly looking for a retest of the peaks that we saw earlier this year um, in May at around about 110.95, 111. So certainly I think on euro dollar, continue to expect further euro dollar gains there, probably not to the same extent um, against the pound. Euro sterling. At the moment, we're holding above this series of lows around about 84.35, 83.35, 83.40, my, my mistake. Um, we did see a bullish reversal here. We haven't followed through on that. But as long as we hold above this 85.30 area, then we could well drift back towards around about 86. But at the moment, um, 85.30, what am I talking about? 85.35, 85.40. If we break below there, then obviously the next area of key support is back down here in the August 2022 low. Ultimately, we're range trading in Euro Sterling. The range is now slightly bigger now that we've broken below the series of lows here at 85.65.70. So any rebounds could well run into resistance around just below 86 does look a little bit oversold, but overall, I think the line of least resistance for Euro Sterling is likely to be for a continued slow drift lower. We've also got UK CPI. Um, obviously, that continues to remain fairly resilient. 8.7% we saw in the three months to April. We're likely to see that soften further not as much as perhaps we would like to see, but when the energy price caps cap gets recalculated in July, then we could well see that the the, the CPI, the, the headline CPI rate comes down quite a bit further. Um, we've already seen a big drop to 8.7% from levels of above 10% in the March numbers. We could see a further big drop back to around about 7.5%. Um, when the July numbers are released in August. We're just going to have to wait a while to um, get side of those particular numbers. Core prices, the core prices which are 6.8%, could come back down to 6.5. But one of the things, the key, and one of the more encouraging um, factors that we've seen in recent retail data was Tesco's came out today and said that they saw signs that retail inflation was starting to come down. Having said that, it's still really high. It's around about grocery price inflation is still around about 17 percent. But with discounting and, and, and everything else, that should come down further. But it's still well below current levels of wage growth. Um, sorry, well above current levels of wage growth. So the 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 pinch is going to continue to be felt, notwithstanding, obviously, the fact that we have a whole row, we all have, we have a whole load of fixed rate mortgages um, coming up for renewal um, from fixes of two years ago, back in 2021, when um, the stamp duty holiday was announced by the government and an awful lot of people went out and bought properties. So we could well see second half of this year. Um, we, we could see a massive, a massive break on consumer spending start to kick in as a whole load of mortgages come up for refinancing going forward. Also got UK retail sales this week on the 23rd. Again, um, not expecting great things from that. Um, 
something in the region of around about maybe 0.1, 0.2%. We saw a 0.8% gain in April. I was surprised by that, given the rise in utility bills that we saw, as well as council tax bills that we saw during that month. And, and I think retail sales could be a bit of a struggle as, as, we, as, as we look ahead. In terms of US markets, once again, we've broken higher. Again, this is one that I've underestimated, got wrong. I, I felt that US markets would underperform relative to European markets. They've done just as well, if not better. Having said that, the, the gainers in US markets have been a very small cohort of about 10 big companies, chip companies, NVIDIA. Um, we've got uh, Meta as well, uh, Tesla done very, very well. Big rebounds there, Microsoft. All the big caps have rebounded strongly after the losses that we saw last year. So that was certainly something that I was surpri I'm surprised by, given the fact that US rates have rebounded and gone quite a bit higher since the start of the year. But it's been very narrow in terms of the breadth of the market. But we are now starting to see evidence on a technical basis of a breakout which could see the S&P head back towards these peaks back in April 2022. So we're talking March 2022, four and a half thousand, four thousand six hundred. You know, the trend isn't lying. It's telling us that the market is going higher. So we do need to be very, very careful. Um, shorts are capitulating. Um, certainly underestimating. Look at the NASDAQ this week. Very big level approaching now, 15,500, which is obviously these, these twin lows back in December 2021. We look as if we're going to retest these levels on a technical basis. Um, you know, you, you, cannot buck, you cannot buck the trend. Um, and certainly if the market is right in thinking that the Fed has done or close to being done, then it won't be long before they start to price in the prospect of rate cuts, which is obviously what the Fed don't want them to do. But ultimately, markets being forward-looking mechanism, that is what they will do. So um, certainly on the, on the basis of those charts there, certainly we're looking at the potential for a retest of those peaks. If we look at the FTSE 100, we can certainly look to see a potential retest or a test of the 50-day moving average, but also a test potentially of this trend line that I've just drawn in through these peaks through through here. So in essence, looking fairly constructive on stock markets, um, much to my surprise, um, still constructive on European markets on a value ba on a valuation basis anyway. I still can't quite get my head around the valuations on US markets, but at the end of the day, I have to park my distrust of that and just look at what the price action is doing. The price action still remains fairly constructive. Crude oil prices still remain subdued. Um, West Texas, $70 a barrel. Brent crude, $75 a barrel. If we look at the way they're pricing, we can see that there's solid support on Brent pretty much all the way through there. I don't see much downside on Brent or WTI on the basis that the US still needs to refill its strategic petroleum reserve. So you've got essentially a little bit of a buyer of last resort down there that's likely to hoover up any oil on the, on the, on the cheap. They're talking 12 million barrels by the end of this year, which probably doesn't seem an awful lot. But at the end of the day, if prices fall low enough, you could find that they buy an awful lot more than that. Um, on the earnings front, it's fairly quiet. We've got Whitbread first quarter numbers on the 22nd, Premier Inn owner Whitbread. Uh, give us a good, decent insight into um, U.S. consumers, how many people are staying, U.S. consumers, U.K. and European consumers, whether or not they're staying at home, deciding not to give the, uh, not, not to risk the airport and all the nonsense that goes on there. Um, we've also got FedEx, fourth quarter numbers out of the U.S. And that's always a generally decent indicator as to, into demand within the US economy. Retail sales there continue to remain reasonably resilient. And we've also got Darden restaurants 
um, who basically own the Olive Garden and Long Longhorn Steakhouse brands. Again, fairly decent bellwethers of consu US consumers disposable income there. One other thing might be what might be market moving, which I haven't mentioned yet. Chairman Powell, Fed Chairman Powell is testifying on Capitol Hill to US lawmakers. It'll be very interesting to see whether or not um, he continues to peddle the line that the Fed expects to see another two rate hikes by the end of the year. And I'm imagining that he will probably face further cross-examination from um, his nemesis, Democrat Senator Elizabeth Warren, who labelled him a dangerous man when it comes to his keenness for further rate hikes, though her attacks have lost a little bit of resonance given the fact that unemployment hasn't gone up since even even accounting for the fact that we've seen 500 basis points of rate hikes from the Federal Reserve in the last 15 months. But nonetheless, don't expect her to give him an easy ride. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this week, ladies and gents. As I say, the key, the key things next week are the Fed, Fed Chair Powell's testimony, Bank of England rate meeting, UK CPI, UK retail sales. Oh, and before I do, before I forget, flash PMIs, France, Germany, and the UK. So that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets.